Hi friends, it's Dana here. Today I'm reading you a story about someone you probably know or at least know of. Her name is Beatrix Potter and you know about her probably because of Peter Rabbit. She drew and wrote all the Peter Rabbit books and they are just adorable and stunning in its uh, art artistry. Um, what I learned in this book is that Beatrix was actually a scientist, not just because she observed animals, but she was a real, real scientist. And this book talks about her journey through being a scientist and how she ended up drawing bunnies and telling stories about them. So here we go. It's Beatrix Potter, Scientist. It's by Lindsay Metcalf and illustrated by Junyi Wu. Here we go. You may know this girl or who she'll become. Someone who makes pictures of cuddly animals and writes your bedtime stories. But there's more to her story. She observes, she questions, collects, records. Beatrix is a girl of science, even if she may not know it yet. See her there, giggling and splashing in the steps of a, the whistling postman? His dirty boots carry him on mail routes past miles of mushrooms and moss. He can't help but look and learn from the lush landscape edging the Scottish Highlands. Nature enchants Beatrix too. She absorbs lessons on art and photography so she can capture every rock, every flower, everything. This way, she can take Scotland home. Back on the outskirts of London, Beatrix sneaks nature inside, past her mother, past the staff. A bit older now, Beatrix and her brother, Bertram, fill their nursery with bunnies and bats and newts, snakes and frogs and mice. But when the animals die, after she cries, she removes their flesh to admire their bones. There's care in every measurement from head to fingers to tail. Beatrix draws them again and again, outside and in. That's science. Now a young woman, Beatrix stows her specimens in London and sets off into the countryside with her family. She grabs her sketchbook and roams through Northern England and Scotland, eyes open to the world so wide. Always she wants to copy any beautiful object which strikes the eye. Sometimes she adds a twist of whimsy. Always she writes. Look there, what does Beatrix see? Tiny fungus people singing and bobbing and dancing. She blinks away the vision of fairies trotting among the toadstools but thousands of mushrooms remain. Joy of joys, she writes. They hold mystery on their own. She peers closer and sees the colors. She slices, sketches, and scopes. Every gill, every scale, every spore. The microscope reveals a new world. Beatrix can't stop drawing. Who will understand? Probably not her parents. They have equipped her with cameras and experiences and tutors, but school is for Bertram. Who will understand? The Scottish postman, of course. The man she knew when she was little more than a spore herself. The shy postman who stashes plants in the sa his satchel so he can study them at home Beatrix and Charles McIntosh discuss how to draw dainty details under the microscope, how to classify each fungus by name. They promise to share their work. Beatrix's train returns to the city. Soon a piece of Scotland arrives in London. Beatrix tears open the package from Charlie and inhales a mushroom scent of fresh cut hay. Curiously strong and pleasant, she writes. The paint and paints the samples with delicate strokes. Then she mails her artwork to Charlie.
Perhaps if Beatrix draws enough, learns enough, her art could fill a science book someday. It's acceptable for Victorian women like Beatrix to excel at painting. Beatrix hopes to earn money and freedom from her parents' rule, even if by selling silly pictures of rabbits wearing coats. Back in the country, Beatrix tugs up her starch dresses and trudges through the bogs, woodlands, and dung where mushrooms bloom. She has questions. How do fungi survive the winter? Do they spread underground? Is it true that spores sprout like seeds? She wrecks her parents' London kitchen in her hunger for answers. She concocts a solution to nudge the spores to life. Toiling day and night in her ramshackle lab, Beatrix zooms in with a microscope to check and record her specimens. She can taste the breakthrough that is sure to come. Finally, yes, spores do sprout like seeds and Beatrix is among the first to grow them in Britain. Before long, the sprouts tangle in a network of filaments called mycelium. This must be the underground form Beatrix envisioned. To be sure, she exhausts herself studying dense volumes on fungi written in German. Then Beatrix drafts her findings for all of science to share. A prominent natural history society could publish her paper, but it's the 1890s and these London scientists do not allow women to join them. Beatrix believes her work is too important to keep to herself. She earns a ticket to enter the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew and mingles with some of Britain's best botanists. But most of the plant scientists there dismiss her as an amateur. Beatrix may not be a professional, but she has pluck. She returns again and again, at first jumpy as a bunny, then growing braver like a bull. She knows of a well-published scientist who can help if she can convince him. Her heart pounds. She clutches her sides and marches up to George Massey, one of the people in charge of Q's plant specimens. George has been trying to germinate spores with no luck. He peers through his spectacles with uncertainty. George cannot deny that Beatrix has sprouted more than 40 kinds of spores. He decides to try her methods. Finally, success. George agrees to present Beatrix's paper at a society meeting. She waits for news. What is happening behind those doors? George returns with a disappointing message about Beatrix's paper. They say it requires more work, she writes to her old friend, Charlie. So she withdraws her paper, rallies her resolve, and returns to her lab. She sprouts more, observes more, and draws more until she doesn't. What makes her stop? Does she suspect that she will never be taken seriously as a scientist? Does she begin to doubt herself? Like pages ripped from a book, history holds those secrets. But the next chapter is all there. Beatrix Potter steps into the sunshine and tries something else, something not altogether different. She pulls out an old letter, one with pictures. A young friend had been sick in bed and needed some good cheer. Her bunny, her Peter Rabbit, looks so real on paper, he nearly hops off the page. This is no leap for Beatrix, even as she tucks away her fungi paintings for good. She doesn't forget what she knows of nature. She follows her muse to, place, to a place where science informs art, a place of whimsy grounded in fact. Beatrix has studied every detail in her world, small and big, flower and fungus, inside and out, and molded it into something new. So she could share it with you and the whole world through. 
Well, friends, I hope you enjoyed that story, that very unexpected story, in my opinion, about Beatrix Potter. And there's a little bit more about her here that I am going to read to you and you can listen along if you'd like. And if you are done listening about this story, you can sign off. But thank you so much for reading with me, friends. Here we go. It's more about Beatrix Potter. Born in 1866 to wealthy parents, Helen Beatrix Potter grew up observing everything around her. When her family left London and vacationed in the countryside, they carried sketchbooks. Beatrix wanted to know every little detail about her world, so she studied and drew a range of subjects, fossils, plants, insects, ancient artifacts with scientific precision. Some of Beatrix's earliest scientific endeavors revolved around the family's pets. Beatrix and Bertram kept a variety of animals, rabbits, yes, but also frogs, mice, birds, newts, a snake, and others. While the potters adored their animals, they believed that after death, the animals' bodies were gifts for study. Many times the children boiled them so they could remove the skin and muscles and preserve the skeletons. That may sound gruesome, but artists in the late 19th century often did this to understand how animals were built so they can draw them more accurately. As a young girl, Beatrix traveled with her family each year to Scotland, where she met the postman naturalist Charles Mackintosh. As an adult, she sought him out to show him her drawings of fungi. The shy, bewhiskered retiree with his dirty boots became an unlikely mentor for a starched and pedigreed young woman like Beatrix. They shared common interests in the growth and classification of rare common fungi, and he gave Beatrix trips, tips about how to draw microscopic details. Beatrix continued to correspond with Charles throughout the 1890s and produced more than 350 drawings of fungi, mosses, and germinating spores. Not only did Beatrix arrange for Charlie to send specimens of fungi, she spent more than 10 years hunting for them herself. She found them in bogs, in woods, on a broomstick outside her house, even on a piece of horse dung. <laughs> she learned their scientific names and examined the specimens under a microscope, then drew them in various forms, whole, sliced, scraped, and suctioned. She developed enough knowledge that she started seeking answers to questions about fungi that few professional scientists had even asked. Wow. She took her results to the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, whose scientists initially didn't believe an amateur scientist, a female scientist, would be capable of making a discovery. But when Beatrix germinated her spores again and again, the Kew scientists tried the experiments themselves. With the help and encouragement of her uncle, Sir Henry Enfield Roscoe, a knighted and renowned chemist, Beatrix wrote about germinating spores in a paper for the Linnean Society, a group of London's foremost experts in natural history. Only men could participate in the society. It was Kew scientist George Massey who agreed in 1897 to submit the paper on Beatrix's behalf. The paper entitled, On the Germination of the Spores of Argonaceae. <laughs> I know I got that wrong. <laughs> a suborder of guild mushrooms, was not approved for publication, and Beatrix withdrew it from consideration. She wrote to Charles Mackintosh that Linnaean scientists said her paper needed more work before it could be printed. The paper was never printed and it was lost to history. Experts can only guess about whether she made a true discovery because Beatrix's journal only hints at the focus of her work. The journal ended in 1897, shortly after she made contact with the Linnaean Society, but she was later shown to be among the first British people to germinate spores from the group of fungi she worked with, Basidomycetes, pronounced Basidomycetes, another tough one, which includes most mushrooms and toadstools. <laughs> A century after she submitted her paper, the Linnaean Society apologized for how it treated Beatrix and other women. Beatrix juggled her passions for art and nature. The day after she found a rare fungus, she wrote the first draft of her most famous story in the form of a picture letter. Five-year-old Noel Moore, the son of her friend, was sick, 
so she wrote him a story about her bunny, Peter Piper. She must have been thinking of Fungi and her friend Charles McIntosh because Mr. McGregor character looked quite like him. Beatrix didn't pursue publication of The Tale of Peter Rabbit for another eight years. In the meantime, she grew more passionate about fungi. During the decade Beatrix studied fungi, she wrote several other illustrated letters to children in addition to the one she had written to Noel. Noel's mother encouraged Beatrix to write books about her characters. In 1901, Beatrix made 250 copies of The Tale of Peter Rabbit. This attracted the publisher Frederick Warren and Co, which released her story widely the following year. Beatrix went on to create dozens of books for children, including some published after her death in 1943. If you look closely, you'll find fungi in the tale of Squirrel Nutkin and the tale of Johnny Town Mouse and the Fairy Caravan. Well, friends, I hope you enjoyed learning all about Beatrix Potter. I learned so much from this book and from everything in it, and I hope you enjoy reading it with me. Thank you so much. Bye.